Hello and welcome to this presentation on Understanding the Twice Line Frequency Vibration. Hi, my name is Jason Tranter. I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Mobius Institute. In this presentation we're going to talk about magnets, magnetism, solenoids and where the twice line frequency vibration comes from. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how motors work so that we can understand why we see the twice line frequency on induction motors. Then we'll talk a little bit about the faults that can be generated um, where the twice line frequency vibration is the key symptoms. We'll talk a little bit about the measurement settings and a few other tips. So first we'll just have a quick introduction to the induction motor. The induction motor is made up of two key components. The first is the stator, the stationary part around the outside of the motor, all those windings that you can see there, and the rotor inside which is obviously the part that spins. If we look more closely at this cutaway diagram you can see that the there are the windings at each end and laminations here. The idea of the stator is to create a magnetic field. In fact, as we'll show, it's a rotating magnetic field that runs around the motor. Inside is the rotor. It's also a metallic object. Current will be induced into the rotor, creating its own magnetic field. Um, what we're going to talk about is the fact that with that magnetic field that's generated, we can generate this twice line frequency vibration if there's a problem with the stator and for other reasons as well. But it's very hard to understand that source of vibration unless we understand a little bit about electromagnetism and the form of current that we supply to an electric motor. So why don't we talk about that a little bit and explain what's going on. Personally, I think there's two ways to look at vibration problems. One is we can just simply say, well, there will be a peak at twice line frequency vibration under certain circumstances. And you can simply take that fact on board and try and remember that fact. And when you see the peak, you can say, well, it could be, according to what I've been told, uh, due to these particular reasons. What I think is a more powerful way to understand vibration analysis and be more successful at vibration analysis is to really understand what's going on inside the machine, in this case an induction motor, and really understand the source of vibration. The better you can understand these things, the more likely it is that you'll make the correct diagnosis when you see a change in vibration. Anyway, so that's the idea of this presentation. The interesting thing is, and you may know some of this already from schooling in the past, but the interesting thing is that if you pass a current through a conductor, a magnetic field is created around that conductor. It's also true that if you move a magnet near a conductor, it must be moving, not just stationary, but if you move a magnet near a conductor, current will flow through that conductor. The current is induced and will flow through that wire or that conductor. If we form that conductor or wire into a coil called a solenoid and we pass current through that solenoid we create a two-pole magnet. In other words it's a strong magnetic field and at one end is the south pole and, and the other end is the north pole. They're the two poles and the strength of that field is proportional to the amount of current flow. So if we push more current through that solenoid, we get a stronger magnetic field. Now there are a number of facts, a little bit hard to absorb all at once. I wanted to just say those things to introduce you to these various concepts and now I'm going to explain them in much more detail. We've created this little simulator here just to show that if this was a conductor, so this is my piece of wire, and what I can do with this little dial down here is if I turn it in one direction, I can make the current flow in a certain direction. And as you can see, we create a magnetic field around it. That's what this blue circle 
indicates. These blue lines are called lines of flux. It just gives you an indication that there's a stronger magnetic field as I push more current through and a weaker magnetic field if there's less current. But the interesting thing is if I put current in the opposite direction, so you see in this direction we've got the arrow pointing as such. If I rotate this around and point it in the other direction we get the arrow pointing in the other direction but it creates the same strength of magnetic field you'd notice that the lines of flux are in the other direction but for now that's not so important and as I rotate this back and forward you can see that as the current flow changes we create a magnetic field as such so that's all great just current flowing through a conductor what I'm going to do now is wind that conductor into a coil that we can see here. So my conductor is now wound into a coil. And it turns out that if I do the same thing now, we create that magnetic field around the conductor, but because it's been wound into a coil, obviously more tightly than what I'm depicting there, and more turns than what I'm depicting there, but if I have current flowing in one direction, we've created a two-pole magnet. That's just like any magnet that you might purchase where there's a north pole and a south pole to that magnet. We push more current through, we've created an electromagnet and we've got, as you can see, a strong north and south pole. Now if I wind that current back down again with no current flowing, we get no magnetic field. Kind of makes sense. But notice in this direction I've got a north pole and a south pole. If I make the current flow in the opposite direction, you see we still get a strong magnet, but it's like I've rotated the magnet 180 degrees. Now the north pole is up here, and the south pole is at that end. So they just change direction. So if I swing it back and forward, back and forward, you see what happens. Those north and south poles switch. Now if I was to do that with a compass sitting there, you see that in one direction the needle switches around and it says, wow, you know, there's a strong magnetic field there, so it overcomes the magnetic field of the Earth, and the North Pole's on the right, so the needle turns to the right. And as we swing it back down and switch directions, the compass switches directions. Now as you're probably also aware, um, Objects like you know, metal iron objects are attracted to magnets. So if you take iron shavings, for example, and put them on a, on a magnet, it's attracted to it. And in fact, for example, if you put a magnet down, put a piece of paper over the top and sprinkle those iron filings over the top, not only are they attracted, but you actually see them follow the uh, lines of flux, those same sorts of patterns that we're showing there. But what I'm going to do now is place here this little base with a spring and we've got an iron ball on the end of that spring. So when there is no current and no magnetic field the spring is sort of relaxed and the iron ball's just sitting there. But now what I'm going to do is turn the current in one direction. Now it creates a strong magnet and you see the iron ball is drawn closer and closer to the magnet. The spring's trying to pull it back, but it's such a strong magnetic field now that that ball is being pulled towards it. Uh, if we swing it back down and go in the opposite direction, what do you think is going to happen? Is it going to be pushed away from the coil or attracted to the coil? Well, it's not a magnet itself, so it doesn't matter to it which way uh, the magnetic field is oriented, it's going to be pulled towards the coil when that magnetic field is at its strongest. So I push it one way, it moves towards it, push it the other way. And in fact, what I'm showing here on these little graphs is the amount of current flow and the, the strain in that spring. So again, if I sort of push it one way and the other way and the other way, you see that the strain, you know, there's a lot of strain, less strain, a lot of strain, less strain. And that is the origin of this twice line frequency vibration. I'll explain why it's twice line frequency in just a moment. But you can see that metallic objects in our motor will be attracted and affected.
by the magnetic field. So if our motor is designed to create a magnetic field, which is what I'll prove to you next, um, then any metallic objects like the laminations for example and like the rotor itself is going to be pulled towards that magnetic field um, when it's at its strongest but if it's weaker uh, it will no longer be pulled towards it anyway for now the key points are that with the current flowing in one direction I have a north-south pole and in the other direction I have a south-north pole when this magnetic field is strongest my iron ball is attracted to it in, in either direction. Okay, so let's have a look at a couple of other things. Here I have just a, a regular magnet and a, and a coil of wire, so there's my solenoid. And what you can see is that as I move the magnet relative to the coil, we generate current flow or and therefore voltage if it's over some sort of resistance but anyway the main point is as I move the magnet we create current flow notice that when it's stationary there is no current flow so when it's stationary down the bottom or stationary at the top there is nothing when I push it one way the needle goes one way when it's moved the other way it moves the opposite direction so that just sort of demonstrates how current can be induced into a coil um, when a magnet nears, uh, moves near it. In this case, the magnet is moving more slowly. And the slower you move the magnet, the less uh, current is induced. So I move the magnet slowly, and less current is induced in that coil. It's also true that it doesn't matter whether the magnet is moving uh, and the coil is stationary or the coil is moving and the magnet is stationary. It doesn't matter. That relative movement, moving a coil through a magnetic field, induces current in that coil. So why am I telling you all these uh, details? Well, it so happens that with an induction motor, the stator is basically designed as a series of coils. So you can think of it like a solenoid. The coils are wrapped around the, the stator in a particular way so that when current flows through it, we get the magnetic field that we've been talking about. However, the key thing is that we are putting an AC current through the magnetic field. Uh, through the coil, sorry. So the power that you supply to it isn't DC power, it just isn't a constant voltage. It looks something like this. So what I'm going to do now is switch my current supply there to automatic, give it a bit of amplitude, and you can see that the needle is moving back and forward all by itself. And this is what we're putting, this is the current that we're putting through it. Notice it's just swings high, swings low, swings high, swings low. That is what the current looks like that's being uh, uh, put through the coil of the stator. Um, in the United States and probably some other places, that current is 60 hertz. In Australia and Europe and uh, other places, it's 50 hertz. Um, so, in this example, let's just call that uh, 60 Hertz doesn't matter which but what you notice here is that when the cycles at its highest the magnetic field is at its strongest the cycle goes up the magnetic field gets stronger the cycle goes down the magnetic field is strong but in the opposite direction um, so you can see we've got this pulsating magnetic field at these zero crossings there is no current so there is no, magnetic, no magnetic field. Now one little detail which is important when we describe the motor is that if I put a coil with the same number of windings inside that magnetic field well that magnetic field will induce current flow just as we saw a moment ago with the moving magnet. We've got this now, you might say, well, wait a minute, it's not moving, is it? It's not physically moving, but from a magnetic field point of view, it is. It's getting stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker. That is a moving or changing magnetic field. And when you get a changing 
magnetic field, it will induce currents in this solenoid here or in this coil. So in actual fact, the current that we see th that we have put through this coil will be induced. Yes, there are some losses and so on, but it will be induced into this coil just because that coil is within this magnetic field. And what have you learned about what happens when you put current through a coil? Well, it will induce a magnetic field. So although we're not showing that, the fact is that we create a magnetic field around that, it induces current, and this coil will create a magnetic field. So when we do something like that, this also becomes a magnet, and north loves south and south loves north so right now we are actually having to hold those two coils apart because we're creating that strong magnetic field here 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 and so on those two coils are actually being attracted to each other because they're magnetic even though I'm, I'm only supplying power to this coil here so this is the way uh, and I'll explain more about this in a moment but this is the way induction motors work it's actually the way transformers work too. We put uh, current through one coil. The difference with a transformer is that we have a different number of coils here, which, which increases or decreases the current flow. Anyway, let's swap that coil well, with a magnet. And in this case, you can see that that compass is going to swing back, forward, back, forward because of the changing magnetic field. And let's put our iron ball on a spring and you can see that that iron ball is attracted towards it and then weakens off, attracts towards it. Now, right there is the reason we see twice line frequency vibration. Because we are putting in, let's say, 60 hertz. So 60 times per second uh, the magnetic field or, or the current cycles up and down. But for every cycle, we get two pulses of strong magnetic field. We get a pulse with this part of the cycle, pulse with that part, pulse with this part, pulse with that part. And therefore, twice or two times per cycle of current, the iron ball is attracted to it. So if that was inside an induction motor and there's loose laminations or loose windings or anything like that. We'll explain more reasons why in just a moment. For every cycle of our current supply, we two times the laminations are all being pulled and affected by the magnetic field. Two times. So if the, uh, the laminations are all tight and the windings are tight and everything else, there is no movement. So we don't expect that sort of vibration. Some motors are designed such that there will naturally be that sort of vibration. But in this case, if there is some looseness, and for other reasons we'll explore in a moment, uh, we get a much stronger force at that twice line frequency vibration. So, let's look a little bit more closely at the induction motor. Just how does it work? Now, to be honest, you know, we set out to understand a little bit about twice line frequency vibration and, and hopefully you get a feeling for what the forces are. But if we look a bit more closely about how the induction motor works, you can see how that vibration relates to the induction motor. And I think when you consider other faults like broken rotor bars and other sorts of faults, some of the vibration you see in that case will make more sense as well. Anyway, what we're going to do with an induction motor is we're going to wind coils around the stator such that when we pass current through we'll create that same sort of magnetic field. Now I've depicted that magnetic field with these lines as you can see, these lines of flux. It actually goes through the center part as well but for graphical reasons I haven't put it there. So I'm creating this, this magnetic field. Now if current was flowing in just one direction at just one strength we'd create a magnetic field with perhaps the North Pole at this end and the South Pole at that end. And it's just for all the reasons we've described so far the difference is that I'm orienting the coils around the stator to create that magnetic field. However, 
remember I'm actually going to put an AC current of let's just use 60 Hertz for the example I'm putting that AC current through those windings so what do we see we see the pulsating magnetic field through one half of the cycle of the current we see the north at the top and south at the bottom and through the other half of the cycle we see north at the bottom and south at the top we get a pulsating magnetic field so that's if I wind it and just look at one single phase of the voltage so that's what that's what we've got so far we've got this nice pulsating magnetic field more current and you get a stronger magnetic field but let's have a look at three phase motors instead three phase motors are supplied with voltage through three different connectors if you like and I'll show you you know with the transmission lines you can see the three phases right here but what happens is those three phases of current flow are not in phase with each other they're each offset by 120 degrees so we've got let's just call it the red phase the green phase and the blue phase and you can see that there is 120 degrees between each one they're not in phase 120 degrees so after the blue phase comes the red phase and the green phase and the blue phase and the red phase etc so that's for very good reasons how the power is supplied to your plant um, that's how the power is provided by a, uh, a variable frequency drive controller and there again is that image with the um, the three phases being provided okay so what I'm going to do now is wind the stator so that I have three of those coils that we mentioned just a moment ago I'm going to have my first phase and we'll call it the red phase and I'm going to wind the stator such that this phase is oriented as shown so we get the north and south pole in this vertical orientation let's say and with the current that I supply to that we get the north and south and then the south and north as you can see it pulsating back and forward just as we saw a moment ago but then what I'm going to do is wind my second set of windings in the stator such that they are physically offset by 120 degrees so my pulsating magnetic field is is offset from the first pulsating magnetic field by 120 degrees and just as before though we're going to get this pulsation between a north and south pole and a south and north pole but remember in addition to having a physical offset of the windings I'm supplying it with a voltage that from a timing point of view is offset by 120 degrees as well so the timing of this pulsating magnetic field is slightly different to the first magnetic field and then we're going to do it with the blue phase as I've got it physically offset by 120 degrees again but because it's wound and it's got a an AC current surging through those windings we'll still get our pulsating magnetic field north south south north and so on but what would happen if I supply my three phase voltage to the three windings with the timing difference between each of the phase and the physical offset between each set of windings what we get then is a difference in timing between each of those magnetic fields and if you watch for example just the North Pole it appears to move around the motor just because the strength of it changes and in fact as you can see that as one magnetic field is weakening the other one is strengthening and the end result of all of this the net effect is this blue phase you see over the top of it it's a different shade of blue to the first one but as you can see you get this effect of a rotating magnetic field and so if we just focus on that alone this is what the magnetic field looks like 
with our induction motors. Now, actually, synchronous motors work in a similar way, but we'll just focus on induction motors for a moment. So rather than, even though those magnetic fields are there in the, you know, the red phase, the green phase, and the blue phase as I have it, when you look at an induction motor from now on, and when you think of about all the different fault conditions and, and how the vibration is going to change, what you can consider is that you have a rotating magnetic field. It's just as if the stator actually isn't stationary. It's rotating at the synchronous speed. And I'll explain that part in just a moment. We're going to have a magnetic field that's spinning round and round the stator. Yep, a nice rotating magnetic field. Now, with a two-pole motor, when we supply 60 hertz, the speed for a two-pole motor will be 60 hertz, or 3600 RPM. For a four-pole, we get half that speed, so 30 hertz, 1800 RPM. That would be the synchronous speed. That that's the speed at which that magnetic field is spinning. And for a 6-pole, it's a third of that 20 hertz. And you can see the same thing is true for a 50 hertz motor uh, or a power supply. Now, we'll talk a bit more about this in a moment. But remember, this is for motors wired up, if you like, in the tra traditional way, just to the power supplied by the plant. If we have a VFD, it could generate a different frequency and therefore you know the speed is is as you can see whatever the actual supply is to the motor for whether it's a two pole a four pole or a six pole we get those different speeds relative now we've talked a lot about the stator we've talked now about the rotating magnetic field but remember even though it's a rotating magnetic field at, at any point on that stator we've got this strong pulsation of the of the 60 hertz um, magnetic field but remember it's pulsating north south south north north south and so on just as we originally instructed now what would happen if we were to take a magnet just a good old-fashioned magnet and try to put it inside the stator while this magnetic field was zinging around. The magnet is going to see that rotating magnetic field and it's going to chase that magnetic field. It is just going to spin, you know, if it was suspended accordingly, it would just spin at the synchronous speed. And in fact, that's how synchronous motor works. There are a few different designs, but basically consider that the rotor is just like a magnet. It has its own magnetic field. So if we put that rotor with a magnetic field inside the stator that has a rotating magnetic field, then it's going to spin. Just as magnets are attracted to other magnets, this rotor is going to want to chase that magnetic field as it goes round and round. And that's why it's called synchronous motor. Because it's got a magnetic field, it will spin at the synchronous speed. It's just going to try and keep up with that um, rotating magnetic field. Now an induction motor is a bit different because with an induction motor we're not inserting a magnet in the inside the stator. We're putting in a rotor that is made of conductors that run lengthways along the rotor. But before we sort of look too much at this rotor itself, what do you think would happen if I was to just take a coil, a solenoid, and put it in the center of that stator with that strong rotating magnetic field? Well, current would be induced into that coil, would it not? And what happens when that happens? A magnetic field would be uh, created around the stator the coil that we just put inside the stator and when we do that being a magnet it sees this rotating magnetic field and it's going to want to chase after it so just by putting a coil of wire into the stator we'll get current flow and so that's the way the rotor is designed now there are different designs and so on but even though it doesn't look like a coil of wire, we have these rotor bars and that allows current to flow lengthways. We have the, the end rings and allows the current to flow from one end to another. So when we put that 
inside this rotating magnetic field, guess what happens? Remember, it's a moving magnetic field. So the moment we put that rotor inside the stator and we create this very strong rotating magnetic field around it, immediately a lot of current's going to go rushing through these rotor bars. And that's actually the problem. That's one of the reasons that motors fail, particularly motors that have that start, stop, start, stop frequently. Because every time they start, they see this very strong magnetic field and we get a lot of current that runs through these rotor bars. But what do you think happens when the current flows through the rotor bars? It creates a magnetic field around the rotor and it sees the rotating magnetic field of the stator and it starts to spin. And the faster it goes, it begins to catch up to that rotating magnetic field. Now remember, if you move, move a magnet through a coil, as we saw earlier, we get current flow. If there is no movement between the magnet and the coil, there is no current flow. So if this rotor was to spin at the same rate as the magnetic field, there would be no relative change in the magnetic field relative to these conductors and current wouldn't flow. It would cease to become a magnet and it might start questioning itself why it's spinning like that and it would start to slow down. But the moment it starts to slow down, it now sees this relative you know, magnetic field moving around it and current will begin to flow and create the magnetic field. The bottom line is that when you first turn on the motor, we get this very strong rotating magnetic field. We get a lot of current through those rotor bars. It speeds up and the faster it goes, we get less and less and less current flow through those rotor bars. Um, and if there was no load, uh, or very little load, I mean there's some friction and windage and so on, um, we will only end up with just a little bit of current through that motor, and that's uh, through the rotor, and that's a good thing. You know, less current flow, less heat, you know, less problems. Um, and that means also the magnetic field is weaker. But when we attach our pump or gearbox or whatever it is to the rotor, that does cause it to slow down. That, that means that there's a greater relative difference in speed between the rotor and the stator. So the more um, of a difference in speed there is, more current flow th through the rotor. So as a result of all of that, we put that rotor in there the current is induced in the coils, it creates a magnetic field and therefore that rotor spins. We get those initial uh, high current flow, a strong magnetic field chases the rotating magnetic field and away it goes. And of course therefore we have a motor. We've got a spinning rotor which of course we can put to good use. And remember, as I just described, because that rotor cannot catch up to the magnetic field. If it does, current ceases to flow, the magnetic field goes away. So there's always a difference in speed between the rotor and that rotating magnetic field. And the difference in speed is called the slip frequency. If you put more load on the rotor, the difference in speed becomes greater. And in fact, if you look closely at this larger version of the magnetic field, of the animation, sorry, look really closely at those lines, you see that the magnetic field is actually rotating faster than the rotor. Now, I'm exaggerating this for the sake of the animation so that you can see what's going on, but you can see that that blue magnetic field, and I'll just get it started again, the blue magnetic field and the brown magnetic field that's um, generated as a result are turning faster than the rotor is. And as I described, that difference is called the slip frequency. That's why induction motors don't turn at exactly 1800 RPM or 1500 RPM and so on. It always turns a little slower. 
Now if I had a four pole uh, motor, I'm going to actually create a rotating magnetic field that turns at, a, at half the speed, but you can see I've got four poles now, north and south, north and south, four poles, two north poles, two south poles. But just for the same reason, it's a rotating magnetic field, we'll induce that current into the rotor, create that magnetic field there. Now the rotating, the magnetic field actually turns slower and that's why we have a slower uh, rotor in this case. So where does all this twice line frequency vibration come from? Well, as I mentioned earlier, as the um, laminations and as the windings and everything else are, are affected by that pulsing vibration, it will always be at twice the line frequency, regardless of whether it's two pole, four pole or anything else. We are always providing to the motor the 60 hertz or the 50 hertz or from the VFD a different frequency, but twice line frequency will always be twice the current the frequency of the current. So 120 hertz for 60 hertz locations, 100 hertz for 50 hertz locations. And you can look at that in CPM as well. So you can see what this is relative to the synchronous speed of the motor. Uh, normally, for a two pole motor, it's going to be twice. But remember, the motor is actually going to go a little slower than 3600 RPM. So there'll just be a little bit difference between the 2x vibration and the twice line frequency vibration. But we'll explore that point in a bit more detail in just a moment. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, our variable frequency drive is actually creating that those sine waves that I described before, the power supply that are offset by the 120 degrees, instead of providing it at exactly 50 hertz or 60 hertz, instead, well, it could be much lower and potentially higher. Um, it's going to create hopefully a nice smooth sine wave, although often it, it isn't. Um, but, you know, VFDs can be used to control the speed it can also be used for a soft start, so to speak. So rather than starting it and providing that 50 hertz or 60 hertz, creating those really strong currents through the rotor, instead we started at a lower frequency, so we don't have such a fast magnetic rotating magnetic field, therefore less current is induced in the rotor, and as we speed it up, that rotating magnetic field goes faster and faster and the rotor goes faster and faster but we never have those really strong currents going through. Okay, so as I just mentioned a moment ago we will have our 1x peak of vibration which actually you can't see on this particular graph because it's very small compared to the twice line frequency vibration but um, for a two pole motor the 2x vibration twice turning speed will be just a little less than our twice line frequency vibration and that's one of our problems if we don't have sufficient resolution to be able to see the difference between the peak at twice running speed and the peak at twice line frequency we could easily look at a graph like this and think oh my goodness we have a high 2x peak. Now in, in this case it dwarfs the 1x peak but you know in, in other situations it may not. Either way we can easily misdiagnose misalignments and potentially other faults as a result. For a four pole motor which we can see here again the twice line frequency peak is just higher than the four times running speed peak and again if we just happen to have you know, four vanes on a pump or something like that, we could confuse that vibration with pump vein rate. And we can certainly be confused and wonder what that, that peak is. So you need the resolution to separate those two frequencies. So now we'll have a look at why we see the twice line frequency vibration in motors. What is important to know is that um, the windings of the stator, I mean there's different designs, but they're wound through these stator slots. What we're looking at here is one lamination of the stator 
and one lamination of the rotor. The windings of the stator go through these slots, and remember they're all offset by the windings are all offset a little bit from each other, and we have windings potentially through the rotor as well, and that's where the current flows through and creates that magnetic field and so on. But look at the very small gap between the rotor laminations and the stator laminations. It's a very small gap. And remember that even though we have a rotating magnetic field, we still have one set of windings creating a very strong um, north-south and south-north magnetic field in one direction, in the other direction, and in the third direction, all offset by 120 degrees. So if this rotor is not perfectly in the middle of the stator, or if there are problems with the windings and so on, such that we get an unbalance in that magnetic field, we will get that very strong twice line frequency vibration. So, if the stator is perfectly round, and if the rotor is centered perfectly within the stator, and if the rotor does not move from that center position as it rotates, which of course unbalance and misalignment and bent shaft and so on might cause it to move, and if the current flow through the three phases are properly balanced and equal through each of those three phases, and if the current flow through the rotor windings or the rotor bars is equal, in other words, none of the rotor bars are damaged or something like that, then all of those strong forces will be kept in balance. The, the forces on that rotor, you know, vertically, horizontally, and at every angle will be equal, and it creates a balance in the magnetic field. It's still a strong magnetic field, but it's balanced in that case. But of course, that may not be true. The gap between the rotor and stator may not be uniform for a variety of reasons. The rotor may be off-center uh, for a few reasons, where in the bearing or the bearing not installed properly or whatever, the, the or misalignment and softwood can pull that rotor off-center and that's going to create a problem. Uh, the rotor may move within the stator because, of, because it's bent, because of misalignment and, and other reasons. The stator may not be perfectly round. It may be eccentric. For example, because of soft foot, we've tightened down on one of those bolts so much that it's distorted the stator. The stator or the rotor may have problems with the laminations. We may have looseness in the rotor bars, looseness in the stator slots, looseness in the laminations or whatever, and they're feeling that pulsating magnetic field and that's going to create vibration. If there's broken rotor bars or damaged rotor bars and the current flow through each one of them is not the same then we get an inconsistency in the magnetic field and that'll create some vibration. Uh, if the stator slots as I mentioned have a problem then that will create a, an inconsistency in the magnetic field and of course if we're only feeding two phases to the motor or well, you can imagine that's going to cause all kinds of problems. We'd only have you know, we'd have a rotating magnetic field, but uh, we've only got you know, two parts of it anyway, it creates problems, we'd, we'd see that. So just quickly, you know, looking at the potential lamination problem and any loose parts in there are just going to vibrate back and forth, vibrate, vibrate, vibrate if there's any looseness. And of course those windings, you know, they've got lack of cover and so on, but if the vibration happens to wear through that and we start to get shorts or something like that, well, that current flow, next thing we know we might have a, a fire or something like that. So that's one reason why we need to test the, you know, the, the strength of the uh, insulation. Um, and so, if we've got that kind of looseness in the laminations or in the, the windings and so on, we expect to see that twice line frequency vibration grow. Um, uh, having a peak there may be normal for a particular motor. Um, if it's high, even though it may be normal, you have to wonder if it's causing any damage. But certainly if you see that peak going up, then you have to question, okay, why 
why is that vibration getting worse? Is it sort of loosening somehow, or is the are the windings able to move more and more? Um, uh, any shorts in the lamination and any warping can also cause that uh, vibration to increase and we can see this pole pass frequency which I'll mention a little bit more about in, in just a moment. So when we look at the interaction between the stator and the rotor the big issue is with uh, uh, static eccentricity of the stator. So I'll show you an image of that in a moment but certainly if that air gap is not even all the way around the circumference in other words, if the rotor is closer to the stator at a particular location, uh, then we can get this twice line frequency vibration. And that is commonly caused through incorrect shimming and soft foot. So we've tightened down on one of the bolts, it's, it's moved the rotor relative to the stator, um, or it's deformed the stator. Either way, the air gap is not even. A little bit hard to see in that animation. And here it's very much exaggerated. We've sort of like squeezed down on top of the motor just to really emphasize the point. And you can see that it's much closer here and here. And therefore that pulsating magnetic field is going to... It's out of balance now. The magnetic field's out of balance. It's much stronger here than it is here. And that's going to really create that twice line frequency vibration. If the stator was sort of just, sorry, if the rotor was pulled off center, then it's only going to be closer at one point. And from a vibration point of view, um, the vibration will be quite directional. In other words, if we had our vibration sensor here and it happened to be distorted this way, that 120 hertz peak wouldn't be as strong as if we moved the sensor up here in this example. Of course, we don't know where that point is going to be necessarily but if you see an increase in vibration it's worthwhile just putting your moving your sensor around the the outside of the motor and just seeing how the vibration changes you know at this low frequency we don't need attachment pads or anything like that just stick it up on top of the fins that's fine you'll see if that peak changes and you might find one point or two points where it's much stronger uh, so in this case, you can imagine that, you know, if I had my sensor actually closer to this point, that 120 hertz or twice length line frequency vibration is going to be much stronger here than it will at any other point, and it'll be weaker up here. So this is uh, static eccentricity. Now, that is really one of the main reasons you'll see that strong 120 hertz vibration and it's often caused from soft foot as I mentioned. Now I won't talk too much about this. This is really something we could talk about for a long time trying to explain these little sidebands and so on. But if we had rotor eccentricity, in this case the rotor is not offset, it's moving around so that the air gap is smaller at a location but that that smaller air gap is moving around the rotor. Uh, you'll see an animation in a moment. It does a better job than, than I do at describing what's going on. But in that case we get this modulation because that that point, let's uh, see the animation. So what we have here is where it's red it is closer to the stator because it's out of balance, because it's bent or whatever. And it may be that way because we have a problem with the rotor. It heats up and it bends. But either way, as you can imagine, as this point here goes in and out of those three or six um, parts of the magnetic field, you know, you know, for the different poles, the north-south pole and so on, as that moves around, it's moving in and out, in and out, and any time you have vibration it rises and falls, rises and falls, you get modulation. And that's what these pole pass sidebands are. The pole pass sidebands will be around this sort of 2x and twice line frequency vib uh, peaks and around the 1x peak. What is the pole pass frequency? Oh, there's another animation that shows it as well. Um, the slip frequency, sorry, the pole pass frequency is equal to the slip frequency, which is the difference between the synchronous speed and 
the actual turning speed it's a slip frequency which is going to be a small number small or low frequency multiplied by the number of poles so it's going to be a small number and therefore those sidebands are quite close to the 1x and the 2x peaks and again if you do not have enough resolution you will not see them you may notice that at the base of the 1x and 2x peak there's sort of like a, a lump if I can put it that way but um, as the um, uh, if, if you use higher resolution spectrum you will see those individual peaks and it's a good idea to look in the log spectrum they'll be much easier to see there in the log than they will in the linear but either way we're looking for that fault uh, that source of vibration and we're looking for the 2x vibration to go up okay a couple of extra points to consider Sometimes when we go out to the motor, particularly with a two-pole motor, we might hear a beating sound. This surging of the vibration. And you might wonder, oh, what's going on there? Well, what you can have is an interaction between the twice running speed or twice turning speed vibration and the twice line frequency vibration. Because they're close together, they can interact now, imagine that the red waveform, I'll zoom in in just a moment, but the red waveform is the, is the frequency of the twice line frequency, sorry, the twice turning speed vibration. The blue waveform here is the twice line frequency vibration. And what happens is they go in and out of phase with each other, and therefore they add together at one point so here if we zoom in we will see that just at this point they are different frequencies but at some points they add together they happen to be just in sync for a little while and at another point here and here they are out of sync with each other now the point of this presentation is not to explain beating per se but if those amplitudes were the same of the two signals we would literally get a surge which would be twice the amplitude and at the opposite part it there would be no vibration they would completely cancel each other out but if they're different vibration amplitudes then they don't completely cancel it's each other out the point is what you will hear is this vibration this source of vibration which rises and falls rises and falls rises and falls and you can hear that beating uh, and it can happen if there's some 2x vibration and some twice line frequency vibration now one other thing to consider when you're looking at um, these sorts of electrically and magnetically related uh, sources of vibration is that if you cut the power to the motor those sources of vibration will disappear instantly because you no longer have a magnetic field these aren't mechanical effects. There's no rubbing. We're not talking about unbalance or something like that. So if we watched a live spectrum from the um, motor and cut the power, we would see the twice line frequency vibration just drop away immediately. And we'd see those pole pass sidebands just drop away immediately. So that concludes our presentation. I hope you uh, see that Twice line frequency vibration is, is common, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem. When it increases in amplitude, you have to think about what the cause should be. You might look at how quickly it's changed. Has it been a step change or a gradual change? And think about what might have caused that change. But it could be looseness in the lamination and some windings. It might be looseness in the rotor bars or you know, state of eccentricity and so on as I've described. Make sure you've got a nice high resolution spectrum so that you can separate twice running speed vibration from twice line frequency vibration and so that you can see those pole pass sidebands. Um, there are other motor faults that can occur won't necessarily push up the twice line frequency vibration but certainly having an understanding of how the motors work and those magnetic fields can really help you to understand the sources of vibration and the sources of sidebands. Um, it's definitely also worth 
looking at the current itself by putting a current clamp around one of the phases or each phase one after another and looking at that signal in your vibration analyzer you can also get a good idea of what's going on if that current is affected as it goes through the stator and it's affected by the movement of the rotor and any damage to the rotor bars and so on the current will change and you will see that by using the current clamp anyway that does conclude this presentation I hope you now have a much better feel for where that vibration comes from and basically how your induction motors work. Thanks very much for taking the time to view this presentation.